have lots of time for questions, so don't be bashful. Yes, ma'am. So, Father, I'd like to ask you to go to the conversation we just had. It's based on um, some remarks you made in a podcast about, because some of it is, is quite, uh, quite um, strong about the necessity to find a spiritual father and all that you do. But the point that I, I thought was wonderful that you made was not just the, um, the uh, well, well, how, how the, the, um, the penitent can influence the uh, ability of the spiritual father to know and to speak by what they demand of him, in a sense. So it's not just what the father says to the person, but it's also the way that this penitent uh, assumes and in some way ex expect that how they, they train or prepare the spiritual father to help them. And how, so how can people do that in a way? Because uh, I think there's a crisis of in confession in a sense in our church right now, especially in the East of North America. The first thing that needs to be done is for us who are hearing confessions, <clears throat> to tell people about it, to, to, to help them understand and to educate them in that sense, mm -hmm. that confession is not a one-way sort of experience. It, 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 it depends on both people. In many ways, it is precisely the same principle that I've tried to apply here by asking somebody here to invest a real need in me today by, by prayer. Um, because that that happen, if that happens, then Christ responds to that need, and then I will receive whatever I'm supposed to be given to that particular, giving for that particular person. Um, I, I do ask people wherever I go, please do not ask me theoretical things, like, you know, concerning the decisions of the third synod somewhere, or about some sort of heresy. I, I, it's not that I don't care, but really I don't. Because you can read about it. In the sense that you can read about it. I, I, what, don't use me like a book or a, a laptop. I'm not a laptop, I'm not a book. Go ahead, put the work, study, or ask your, you know, your, your parish priest. But if you have the opportunity to meet a person face to face, then interact and you will receive according to the measure that you invest in that person. And that is entirely true when it comes to confession and spiritual fatherhood. I see that from both perspectives. When I am desperate for a word from, from Christ, my spiritual father, and I've had the same spiritual father since I was 18 and a half, and I could just give you books of quotations from him. I, I literally can just imagine, I know what he's going to tell me. There's no need for me to ask for advice. I no longer do, actually. In conf my confessions last for two or three minutes. I just say what I have done. He gives me the absolution. And then the conversations can happen at any other moment. Uh, but when I'm in a real moment of, of a crossroad or desperate for, for a word, he comes up with the weirdest, most unexpected things. Although I have asked him the same question years before, many, many times, and I've seen him always use his brain, again, the experience he's had in his life, things he has read, and I've read as well, because how many Holy Fathers do we have? I mean, there comes a point where you kind of know. I can tell him, oh, that comes from, you know, that one, that particular book. But then when my need is real, he becomes someone else. He just becomes some, he says things that contradict himself. And that's when I realized that this is not actually him, this is me doing this to him. And then I've noticed it in confession as the priest receiving the confession. I immediately sense what and how much the person in front of me invests in this confession and in myself. There are people who come and you just, you just know, oh, this is going to be a conversation. And then you become a partner in a conversation. Some people come to preach you, to you, and you just kind of just put your head down and you humbly just listen to their preaching. Other people come and you can sense their hearts just like fluttering. I don't even know if that's a word. They're just there alive in front of you and there's a need. And I am just paralyzed by the responsibility of answering that need 
And I say the craziest things. And they work. They always, always work. Where those things come from, I don't know. I trust it is Christ. But I know that they do come because of what these people have invested in me. Saint Seraphim again um, did say that every time I've used my mind and my human experience to answer a question, I have made mistakes. And some mistakes were great. So now I just pray through whatever that person has to tell me. And the first thought that I receive in prayer, I tell to that person. And that, that's when the end of the conversation happens. Forgive me, just one, one last thing. It is, I mean, we do know as early as the 5th, 6th century, so the very first monastics in Egypt, that there is that famous question, why do we no longer have spiritual fathers? Where have they disappeared? Why there are no great Abbas like in the past? And the answer comes very clearly. There are no spiritual fathers anymore because there are no spiritual sons and daughters anymore. And if there's not a real need, Christ will not answer it. Christ is always answering to real needs. And if those are not there, or if we don't acknowledge them and open up to them and express them in confession, they don't get answered. And we just carry these burdens, we carry these wounds to our whole lives. Please. Do you think uh, God is in pain in that when we hurt each other, we're hurting God? Why is that important to you on the question? I'm, I'm trying to understand what, 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 what hangs on that question for you personally. Well, I was thinking of what you said, that we're all, billions of us, are God in a way. And we hurt each other um, at different points in our life. We go to confession um, to turn things over to God. But... It seems like, I always sense that God is waiting for all of us, that he loves us and he's waiting for us to acknowledge that love. And it, it just seems so many people I meet don't turn to God. And that must hurt. Aren't we made in his image? I mean, First, that's what I would like to underline again. I have not said that we are God. We are made in God's image. And we know of God either through the person of Christ or through the, what has been revealed to us concerning the Holy Trinity. It's a different statement to be created in the image of than to be that particular being. Although we shall be one with God, and the intimacy of that is another conversation, um, and what oneness really means there. I don't know. I mean, even if, if I just think, I, I like... No, that's a wrong word. I try and I struggle to live my life as practically as possible and to not allow my mind to kind of wander about asking things that are not vital to me because of the same reason. Because if something is not vital to me, Christ will not answer me, but my brain will. And there's always a risk of me receiving the results of my brain activities as a revealed truth from Christ. And what happens in time is on the one hand you kind of pump yourself up and you become a powerful person even if you don't realize it. And on the other hand you end up with this God that is not so much God himself as is the result of your own brain. So anything that, that's why I, I try to push people and say why is that important to you? Why does that matter to you? I cannot make a claim about God because I have not seen him face to face. It is the honest reality and I have no intention to claim otherwise. I cannot imagine on the other hand a happy, cheerful singing God um, given what you just said, given the, the, the world around us and the experiences we see. I do not know of any icons that we paint of Christ, even the ones that are not about the crucifixion, the ones, uh, I mean, there's a famous icon 
What about the two of you going to Moscow? When you go to the Tretyakov Gallery, my absolute, I just love that icon. It's the only icon of Christ I can personally I pray to. I have a lot of issues with icons of Christ, but that is the only one that I love. It is a Byzantine icon painted um, in the Balkans in the 11th century, and it's called um, Christ of Glory. It's in the Tretiakov Gallery. You will see it. It's a dark image. It's called Christ of Glory. And he's depicted like this, completely naked, with his, just, just his, his head just collapsing down towards his heart. And he's entirely black, with so much sadness that his eyes are closed. And there is no cross around. This is not a crucifixion. That is the only Christ I, my heart, can respond to. Because if you feel pain for the world around you, how much pain must Christ feel for the same world? You have not created this world. He has. You do not know the inside struggles and the pain of all these people. He does. You and I have not died on a cross to give life to these people. He has. He, you or I, every time somebody offends us or says something bad about us, we immediately recoil and we take a step back and we kind of forget about love and all of that Christian nonsense and we build our nice walls, our fortresses to protect us against these people. Christ was crucified by us and he still gives himself to us to this day so we may be saved. He is turning his death. Our crime, he is turning into a weapon for our salvation. If you and I can master the smallest sadness for the world around, I just do not even want to approach what God must be feeling. But you see, it's a bit weird to say all of these things because we are applying human words to God. And that's why I'm reluctant. That's why I, I always try to qualify all these statements. God is feeling. What exactly does that mean? I mean, we don't know. You know, a feeling, a thought, uh, all these words we, we've developed here in this created world, like this chair, you know, it belongs to a time. It, it's been developed in this three-dimensional world. We, our logic is limited to this material three-dimensional world. God isn't. Everything we say about God, every single statement we say about God, even dogmatic statements, they can be fully true, and yet they're always fake on some level. Because God is not... See, we say God is good. He loves us. What does He mean in relation to God. Do we really believe that God up there has a gender, male or female? Do we really believe that God up there is either singular or plural? Why do we refer to Him instead of they? Because there's a trinity as well there. I mean, all, all of these things limit so much our vocabulary and our frame and our ability to make any statement about God that I honestly again see how the wealth and the certainty of tradition, if we ever lose that, we are lost. Because all these saints who write theology, their theology is informed by their experience. And you can sense how much they struggle to make any claim. And they begin their books or even their canons by asking for God's forgiveness and mercy for daring to make a statement about God or the mother of God. And here we are just throwing, you know, tomes and tomes of libraries of statements with not a worry in the world because we have reduced theology to a game of chess. The way I've taught during my uh, postdoc in Oxford, I've taught students and they receive theology the way they receive knowledge about literature or history. They hear concepts, names, dates, and then they start to move them about like in a game of chess. But it's all here. There's nothing here. 
And until things come from here, it's all on the outside, and it's much safer to just keep quiet. So I'll, I'll, uh, I, I have a question that's like an experiential question, and maybe I'll, I'll provide like a caveat so you, so you know where this is coming from. Uh, I listened to one of your podcasts, Father, about you know the theology of or the experiential aspect of the body in prayer, so that there's you know, an emphasis on the body and the mind, yeah. but not exclusively. And I'm also thinking about how you know with me or with plenty of us, we, we hear the statement like crucify the flesh with its desires, as if somehow the body is bad when really. You know, you emphasize that both are important in prayer. So I was wondering, particularly in regards to the fact that the monastery is in a very rustic place, and you've done a lot of hiking, <coughs> and you sleep in a tent. What's it like for you, um, in terms of your experience, not only in your mind but in your body, when it comes to prayer and to your everyday experience? In a way, it's related to something I was struggling to express a bit earlier. <clears throat> As human beings, we are not just bodies, just the way we are not just souls. We are not, again, this chair. This chair only has a body. It has absolutely no soul. Or even a, a more clear comparison would be the corpse of somebody who has died. That corpse is just the body. The soul is no longer there. That corpse is not the human being. This chair cannot be like a human being. We are body and soul. In that way, we are different from everything that is material, but we are also different, forgive me, from the spiritual world around us. These are the two extremes, the spiritual world of the angels and the material world of, you know, chairs and tables and so on. So to, to address God, to pray without using your body, to imagine somehow that prayer is only a soul thing, a mental thing, something that you do exclusively by reading or saying prayers in your mind or singing or without any involvement of your body, that is not a human being's prayer. That is a prayer, in the best case, of an angel, but that is not proper to me or to you. Similarly, I know people, and again, this is a huge temptation in the East, in the Orthodox countries, where prayer is reduced to the body. And it's everything about the fasting and standing in the right position and kneeling at the right time and all of that side, prostrations and so on. But the soul of it, the need to make that prayer your own. <clears throat> Again, something you truly mean when you say something to Christ in prayer, that is very often forgotten. And that is, again, not a human being's prayer. That is the prayer of a chair or the prayer of a corpse. A human being, as long as we are alive, has a body and a soul. And our prayer should be informed by both. That is part of the reason for fasting. Because when you fast, you become somewhat transparent to the spiritual world and your prayer becomes different. That is the reason why we stand through our services. Because even if we don't do prostrations, there is a tension in your body. You, you, you never forget your body. It's there with you before Christ. That is why we do prostrations in our rooms. That is why some of us struggle through uh, night vigils. That is why we go on pilgrimages and we walk and we go to the physical places where these saints have lived. Because we exist in this, at this intersection between the spiritual world and the material world. And anything, prayer included, that excludes either the body or the soul is not proper to a human being. It has to have both. I'd rather stop there, although your question is a bit more personal. But I'd rather keep, keep it there. <laughs> I was just thinking about like nature. Like you clearly probably have a beautiful land around you too, and you do 
I do, yeah. and and, uh, and what attracts me there is not really the beauty. It, it's it's interesting. What attracts me to the island is actually how um, remote and um, <coughs> empty he is during the winter. For me, that that's why I'm there. Summers are things I have to put up with. <laughs> and, uh, the, and I just abandon myself in the summer. Thank God for the pilgrimages. Because then again I meet people. And when I meet people, if you constantly try to be open and not, not become a sort of a formula human being, you will always meet real people with real questions, real <coughs> needs, real stories. If, if, you, if, you, if you struggle to have a question, and a real interest in anybody, you can meet a thousand people and never feel tired and never feel bored. Bored because there's there's so much you can get from any anyone. So summers for me are kind of I struggle through them and I make it through them because of pilgrimages. But then winter comes, and winter winters for us, although we are as far north as Alaska, for instance, to put it into context. We don't get the snow and we don't get the coldness of Alaska. We get storms, winds, rain, darkness, and very short days, really, and complete solitude. Very few people come because there's no certainty concerning the ferries. You may come and just not make it to the island, or you may make it to, to Mal and not be able to go back. And because everybody has a job, you know, people can't take that chance. So pretty much after the end of September, there's no one coming. For me, that is ideal. Uh, it's ideal because what is depressing to other people is perfection to me. There's so much fog around that at times you cannot see your neighbor's house. And that's just, you know, where that forest begins. It's almost as if there's a, there's a dome of clouds around where you are. Like God is building yet again another beehive, but this time it's made of fog. And that makes the world so small. It, it, it reduces everything to you and just God. And if you, if you could just reach out, you could grab him. There's, there's a feeling of being so intimate to Christ. There's a feeling of all your worries disappear. There are no plans. Nothing is to be done. It's like everything that concerns the world and its worries exists somewhere else in this distant land called summertime. <laughs> During the winter, all you have is that little cave or igloo or beehive that God creates for you and nothing to do except to give yourself to him and he's so close there um, I'm actually someone who probably if I did get my way I would end up being in a room for the rest of my life I love nature but nature doesn't benefit me as much as the feeling of seclusion and just, just being completely cut away I need, there's a, free, there's a freedom I have experienced only a few times in my life um, when there's nothing you expect to happen. I don't know how, how else to describe it. There's no deadline. There's nothing on your list. It, it makes completely, it's completely irrelevant if it's day or night, if it's Monday or Tuesday, if it's this week or next week, because when there's nothing to to be achieved, nobody expects anything of you, and you do not put any pressure on yourself to, to achieve things, this entire thing about time proves itself to be such a silly lie, and something that we just kind of use to torment ourselves. There's a wonderful, wonderful sense of freedom you can get by and when God allows this wonderful bubble to be formed around you. And I've only experienced that there. I've seen it in other people, in other places. But for me, because I need this feeling of physically being removed, I've only uh, had it there. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, I had a question, and it's, it's more practical in the sense of how do we make 
thousands of decisions each day and to discern that which is for your spiritual benefit. And really there's encouragement to do more typically, but when you have a scrupulous or a overachiever type of mentality that you, you doing more may not necessarily be beneficial, how do you discern the right for, for your spiritual your spiritual well-being? How do, you, how do you discern that, you know, other than speaking with your spiritual father oh, it's just on, a a periodic, on a periodic basis, but you're, you're making this every day, hundreds of times a day, thousands of times a day, to, and then having a true authentic time. The real solution, which may be completely unpractical as an answer to you, but the real solution is that you do begin by asking the advice of your spiritual father, and you should continue by forcing yourself to put it into practice as often as you can. Uh, but ideally, there will come a time when you will have a feeling. It, 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 it's no longer a question of discernment. You just do the right thing because it becomes like your instinct. Our, our minds and, and our decision-making processes, are, we like to think of our minds as being these wonderful complex things and you know they do glorious. The reality is that it's a piece of meat, uh, you know, in a silly kind of job we call the skull and there's some water in there and all sorts of fluids and it's meat it rots just as easily if not easier than this you know hand uh, and it can be trained almost in the same way you train your muscles if if i do this a thousand times a day for a month and then i keep my hands in my pockets the minute I take them out, I'm going to do that. And I won't be thinking about it anymore. It's not going to be a decision anymore. It won't take uh, and not even a fraction of a second. It will do that by itself while I can do something else. And it's the same in the way we kind of discern good from bad, or good decision from a bad decision. If you apply it yourself, even to a limited number of decisions through the day, and you, you make an aware decision, and you kind of justify it before your conscience why you've made the decision, and you basically train yourself to a point where you will choose the right thing without knowing you've done it. It's just going back to being created in the image of God. And there's always that silly question, what if God had not loved us? What if God had not decided to sacrifice himself for us? What if these are stupid questions that only stupid beings like us, human beings, could ask? Because these are not options for God. Doing evil or not doing the good that can be done is not an option for him. It's who he is. It's nature. It's his nature to always love, to always give, to always do anything to save anyone in any possible way. God does good, not because of a choice, but because this is who he is, this is his nature. We are not there, but we can almost mechanically train our will to do the right thing. And then it becomes an automatism. Okay, if we're struggling with scrupulosity or pride, yeah. Can you give me a pragmatic approach to those difficulties that we're struggling with? For pride, probably God is already well, hurting. Or is that maybe some, another, you know, if you, if you have God and then there's a, there's a buildup of this resentment, even though it's, yeah. it's, a, it's well-meaning initially. So these are the, these are the types of, the, the gray areas that is the decision, which is, is it good for me or not good for me to do this particular activity? There are two things. If it's pride, God, you... God is probably all, already providing you with everything you need in order for you to be healed of your pride. The way to be healed of your pride is to be honest about your sin. If you're honest about your sin, whatever that may be, whatever that may be, I mean, we all have our, our sin, our defining sin that we simply cannot get rid of or we struggle with for a while and then it goes away and then it comes back. If you focus on that, and whatever you do, and whenever you interact with people, if you focus on that, and you allow that to inform your reactions, there's no place for pride. I cannot be proud if I always keep before the eyes of my mind my sin. How can I condemn anyone 
when I have here my sin? How can I judge anyone when I have here my sin? How can I throw a stone when Christ writes very clearly here my sin? That's, and that I have seen as someone again who hears confessions, I have seen happening again and again. Usually people who struggle with pride have a very particular sin that just does not go away. And there's a reason why. The reason is to keep you in check. As for being a scrupulous sort of person, that's something else. The best advice as I have seen concerning that is uh, at the beginning of St. Isaac of Syria's uh, kind of writings, where he's very clear that if when you embark on the holy life or the ascetical life, he says, he writes to other hermits, but it can be perfectly applied to us as well. He says, the one thing you need is a lot of generosity concerning yourself. I'm paraphrasing because I'm not good at memorizing things. He's basically saying you have to be willing to be rather lax with yourself. If you want to reach perfection, you cannot allow yourself to become OCD about everything because that will kill you. It will kill you in the sense that it will just become too much. You'll collapse under depression and a feeling of, oh, I, I shall never be able to do this. You will just have to allow yourself to be imperfect and keep moving ahead. And as you move ahead, it's like you have these, how do you call them, like uh, thousands of bees? What are they, a flock of bees? Swarm. 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 Swarm of bees all around you. These are all the things you're concerned with. If you stay put and you just fight them, they're going to eat you alive. Nothing will happen. Just continue to move. Just continue, and in time, you will lose them. If you just don't pay attention, to them, if you just continue to move ahead, there will be less and less things around you. Uh, uh, this generosity towards oneself, and laxity almost towards oneself, is something I've learned from perhaps the greatest, if not, I mean, for me, he's the greatest ascetic that we know. So he's a, this is a man who lived again alone in his cell and read so much and cried so much that he went blind. Speak of pain for humanity. He went blind with tears of repentance for his sins and for the world. And he says the way to success is to just keep calm and carry on. That very British piece of advice. <laughs> Forgive me, I've you've raised your hand several times. Father, I think that uh, in the West, especially, but I've seen it in the East, um, monastics or the monastic life is seen as almost a scandal, uh, leading the world, and um, uh, not being connected, as you said, you know, we're so connected with each other, we belong to each other in the body of Christ. <coughs> Uh, the, the people often don't see that, um, you know, how a person can walk away and have that, that focus, uh, as you're talking about in September, <laughs> uh, beyond September, you and God, yeah. um, as, you know, a monastic would experience. But can you explain how, um, how that person is, is very much uh, aware of the body of Christ and and all of the people, even though they're not meeting another person. Yeah. First of all, I wish monastic life would be immensely more scandalous than it is. I really, I really <laughs> wish that were the case. I really wish that monks and nuns kind of owned up to, to the very extreme radical life that we are called to lead. I wish we were less part of the world. I wish we were more secluded. I wish we did not use the excuse of hospitality and kindness and uh, you know helping the world in order to shy away <coughs> from what we perceive as being difficult when it's a bit too late because you're already a monk or a nun. Saint Siluan, one of our greatest, most recent saints, said that helping the world practically building orphanages, having old people at home, and all of that is a good thing, but it's not yet monastic. 
and I know exactly what it means. Because the world can do all of that, and much better than we do. Much better than we do. What the world cannot do is try to... I've done this before, and I've done it the wrong way. So I've only done it once. I'm a very visual person. If you imagine this piece of cloth like being the world, the way secular people go about helping other people is just to travel the world. You go on a surface, you go everywhere, you cover as much space as you can, and you think in terms of numbers. Obviously, here you are, you have a parish. The success of a parish is outwardly seen in the numbers of the people who come. That is entirely silly, but that's the way in the world things are understood. There is a horizontal sort of way of looking at the world, where you go out and you reach many people. A monk or a nun does not work or should not work horizontally. We should work vertically. We should be in only one place, but go as deep as possible. Because when you've again, when you've acquired the Holy Spirit, thousands around you will be saved. You may go to 20 people a day and talk to them about Christ, and maybe one of them will actually receive the word. I have my doubts if that actually will take root. Because usually people who convert based on logical arguments find it very easy then to lose their newly found faith based on other logical arguments. But when something happens in your heart, you cannot lose it. Because whatever argument you're being given, even if it's a perfect argument, it does not erase the reality of your experience. When a monk or a nun here manages to be saved, they do that. Do you see the world? All of a sudden, in one moment, one person going up, look at all those around that are also lifted up. Just by, instead of going that way, you go this way. That's what a monk and a nun is supposed to do. <coughs> but most of us, myself included, fail to do. But that's the scandal we should be to this world. And it's not something monasticism invented. It's something that actually... Christ has taught us. Um, we read, I mean, I read all these things about the meaning of the Lord's Prayer and so on, and pretty much everyone makes the same point. Our Father. See, it's not my Father. It's our Father. Forgive us our trespasses, and so on. So this is clearly the content of this prayer should not be about you alone or myself alone. I have to carry us, we, in the content of my prayer. But just one <clears throat> line before Christ tells us what to pray, he also tells us how to pray. You go into your room and you close the door behind you and pray in secret, so the Lord who sees things in secret will hear you. You see how once again it's the same story. Each of us is a person, but each of us as a person have the capacity to have in us the whole world. The content of our prayer should be the whole world, should be love for the whole world. But the way to pray is on a personal basis. You have to make this prayer your own. You cannot erase one or the other. You cannot erase the oneness, the personhood of each of us and just turn us into this mass of dying flesh. And then you cannot lose sight of the fact that we do have to pray for us, not just for me and my little tribe, my husband, my wife, my children, or my monastic brothers. That's a little tribe. And tribalism has been condemned canonically by the Orthodox Church. 
It's us, all of us. Thank you. Father, we did say something about St. Columba. You mentioned him a little while ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just curious what, what... First of all, this is the first time I've heard this question, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to betray the person who asked me. St. Columba is a male. <laughs> uh, and the, the reason for the name, the reason why it's ending in A, is that it's the Latinized version of the name. In, in la many names of the, of the Gallic language would end up in a consonant, and then uh, in Latin they would add an A. I think for me the most striking example was uh, Saint Hilda. The proper name is Saint Hild, but she's a female. They just added the A because that's how Latin language works. Um, Saint Brigid became Brigitta or Brigitte. It had to have an E or an A at the end because that's how Latin works. Saint Columba, um, Saint Columba. I struggle. I mean, I no longer do, but I used to struggle with Saint Columba because I felt, I felt when I went to Iona. I'll begin this way. The first time, I thought, oh, this is the Iona of the great Saint Columba. I'm going to walk there and I'm going to have a vision and the saint is going to be in great, you know, the silly things that a 20-something-year-old monk imagines um, in his stupidity. And I got to Iona and I felt nothing. <laughs> nothing. Just nothing. And when you have great expectations and then there's nothing, it's even more painful to experience it. To make it even more difficult, when I got inside, there's a very, very small chapel called St. Oran's Chapel, made from stone. The foundations of those go back to the first millennium. It's actually the only building on Iona whose foundations still you know, relate to the first millennium. When I entered that particular church, dedicated to St. Oran, I just wished I had the well, I think a shovel, mm -hmm. to just dig myself a grave and just be there. I felt so loved, so welcomed, so just almost physically embraced by this saint Oran, of whom I knew nothing. Zero, Father, absolutely zero. I wouldn't have known to spell his name until I went inside. So by comparison, St. Columba was quite off footish with me. <laughs> uh, things have changed, and I think they've changed because of St. Oran. I've then discovered in the life of St. Columba that he put it almost as a commandment to people who would come to pray to his relics, and then in his lifetime who would come for his advice, he would not receive them before they went and prayed to St. Oran. And I had absolutely no idea about that. He, St. Columba, left Ireland in rather dubious conditions. We don't exactly know what happened. There are all sorts of stories, the most common of which is that he had some sort of a fallout with his spiritual father, St. Finian. There was um, um, sort of a quarrel concerning a manuscript. The law at that time said that if, if this is a copy of the Psalter and it belongs to you, I get it from you for a while and I make my own manuscript on my own, you know, uh, calm skin with my own materials. It takes me a year, God knows how, how else. But then the frustrating thing is that when I finish my copy and I give you back the original, I have to give you back my copy as well. That was the law at the time. And St. Columba felt that this was a rather unfair law. And he gave back the copy to his spiritual father, but kept, uh, gave the original, but kept the copy. And that created a break between the two saints. And that created a battle. And in that battle, people were killed. It's a bit weird for us today to imagine people fighting a real battle and losing their lives for a book. But that was the reality back then. And as a result of that, St. Columba was expelled from Ireland, and he left Ireland. Um, he could have stayed closer by, but he took it upon himself as an extra sort of repentance for what had happened, to travel as far north from Ireland as 
when he would look back to no longer be able to see his home country. So they sailed and they sailed and they sailed, and when they reached Iona in 563, there's uh, a bay called St. Columbus Bay where the two of us had traveled. And on that bay, there's a little hill, which is known to this day, it's marked on maps, as the hill of the turning back to Ireland. Because that's where St. Columba climbed, mm -hmm. looked back, and could no longer see Ireland. So they settled on Iona. And it was St. Columba and 12 other monastics with him, one of which was St. Oran, another one was St. Uh, Kenneth, uh, both of which are connected now with islands and you know, sites around Ireland. And, Ireland. and he established perhaps the most important uh, monastery of that particular time on Iona. It was extremely influential in the entire European um, world both culturally and spiritually. It gave an enormous number of saints. It created wonderful manuscripts. The famous Book of Kells, for instance, which is kept now in Ireland, was made on Iona. It's the place where the famous um, tall, high Celtic crosses were created for the first time. I'm actually wearing a replica of the very first Celtic cross we know of. It's called St. John's Cross. The original of this um, is now in the museum on Iowa. It, it's an entire world there. And then they also went into the world and created other, other monasteries. The famous monastery of Lindisfarne, for instance, in the northeast of England, was founded by St. Aidan, who was a monk on Iona. He was sent by the monks on Iona to establish another monastery in Northumbria. All of this was erased uh, because of a combination of Viking attacks and a break from the Church of Rome that happened in the 7th, 8th century. From Northumbria, from Lindisfarne, yes. the gospel spread to Western Europe, which was pagan and illiterate. It was in the Dark Ages. Yes and no, we can't make that claim entirely. The, 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 history, the history in Europe, and the same is in the British Isles. Thank you for coming, Father, and, and do keep me in your prayers. Thank you. Uh, the history of Western Europe and the British Isles as well is this kind of wavy thing, where you have a wave of Christianity, and people would convert, and for a while, things would be Christian, and then paganism would revert, and then another wave would come. You see the same thing in Scotland. And when we speak of St. Columba as being uh, the missionary to the Isles, but almost 200 years before St. Columba, we know that St. Ninian traveled to the Isles. And yet when St. Columba came to the Isles, he found nothing but pagans. We speak of, yes, Iona going to the Western world, Western Europe, and um, re-Christianizing it. But St. Ninian, in the year 300, had taken inspiration to build his monastery, Whitholm, from Western Europe. So it, it's an ongoing process where Christianity and paganism just, for a long while, kind of fought. Any other questions? Well, forgive me, uh, Father, if I ask a uh, trivial question. Nothing cheap. I noticed that uh, uh, Orthodox monks, uh, Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Muslims, Orthodox Russians, Orthodox anything you can put a lowercase or an uppercase of old on have beards such as yourself. What is the significance of that? Well, I don't know. I wish you didn't have that. <laughs> because they are very annoying. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't like them. And my mother hates it. And every time she sees me, she just sighs <laughs> in a way that breaks your heart. And, uh, it's also just not behaving itself. Some people have glorious beards. They grow nice and kind of very you know, dignified. Like I haven't seen Star no, no Star Wars. There are some kids who play where they the great wizards and beautiful beard. Mine grows like a broom. <laughs> I have to keep it in check. 
I suppose, because in all honesty, although I am a monk, I shall be 14. I shall celebrate 14 years of monasticism uh, on the Feast of the Annunciation. I have never had the curiosity to look that up. <laughs> I do things, a lot of them, based on tradition. I do them because that's what I've been told to do, that's what I've seen people do, and I want to belong to that tradition. That being said, I'm convinced it's linked to the idea of chastity. And um, who was it? Uh, Samson, you know, not cutting his hair because this happens as well, uh, not cutting his beard and so on, not having the presence of a nice lady in your life to chop your beard and his hair off. So I think it's linked with the idea of chastity and it's a visual way to express that. Uh, you could push it, but I, I wouldn't. Uh, the reality of the spiritual reality of a monastic life should be that we are dead to the world and a dead person doesn't really care for his facial hair. Uh, that is pretty much the, the, the principle that should inform one's entire monastic life, being dead to the world, going to the extremes that you see in the Desert Fathers and, and, and so on. Um, but that's all I can offer you. You know when you enter a monastery, no one has ever set me down in all my years as a novice in Moldavia to explain to me why things are done a certain way. I got there as a novice and by definition you are the last one among them. First service I saw that starting with the oldest monk who could hardly move, which gave me a lot of time for observation, they went <laughs> and they venerated an icon, then they went to the abbot and got a blessing, then they went to another icon, and then he got out. And then I saw the next one doing the same, and the next one doing the same. And when it was my turn, you have to be crazy to do anything different. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same and then I just fit in. That's, for me, that is what tradition with small t is. Not, it's not a tradition of our dogma and so on, but it is just observing people and trusting them to lead you where the saints have led them. St. David of Wales, whose feast day, is it the 1st of May or the 2nd of May? First, first. first it's his feast day today. Yesterday. Oh, yesterday was his feast day. Um, his very last sermon before he passed away was, do the little things that you have seen me do as I have done them, having seen the saints do it. That's how things get passed from one generation to another. Not about the beard, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but mine's a more of a practical question about your community. Yes. How large, how do you, do you grow your own food? Do you have livestock? Or when you do eat, where do you, you know, where do you get your food? We get our food from uh, Sainsbury's. Or, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, it's too expensive for us. We buy, <coughs> we buy our food. And it's, it's a deliberate choice. Uh, as long as I am involved in that particular monastery and as long as people who will be members of the community will not decide that they just don't care what I say, I want to buy our food. What Deacon John has not included in my BA, Master Degree, PhD, Postdoc sort of CV is that I actually have two bachelor degrees. Uh, my first bachelor degree is in economics. And my economical mind had this, this way of understanding things. I need to drink this and eat a potato. I can be outside in the rain, planting the potato, taking care of the potato, and doing all of that to the potato. And then by the end of it all, I shall have the wonderful, delicious, nourishing potato, and I shall eat it. End of story, night comes, I go to bed. Or I can say my prayers, write some booklets, read, record some podcasts, travel the world, organize some pilgrimages, get some donations, buy my potato, eat it, 
and the story, now it falls. If you compare the two, the difference is that if I work the land to get my potato, you don't exist. But if I do everything else, then I depend on you to have my potato, and you become vital to me. Because anything that's necessary for this thing is vital. In other words, if we are so few in the world as a, as a whole, not only in our community, there's such a, a, a small number of monastics who, who could do something in this world, rather than to use the time in order to plant what I would be eating, I would rather use that time to create something that benefits you, and I also get my food. It sounds like a win-win sort of situation. How do you um, how do you pray for specific situations without feeling invited to a certain outcome and then getting dis disappointed? Because it seems like a lot of times it seems like I should just pray, Lord, I will be done. Like I feel more freedom in that than praying for like a specific, you know, even just like for the health of someone, but then you see their health deteriorates. Yeah, and then you have all these examples in our tradition of somebody whose health has been restored only for them to go on and do something nasty and endanger their own salvation, and then you kind of feel, oh, what have I done? Because had that person passed away, maybe that would have been their salvation. It's just, things are so complicated, you have no idea what to pray for. What I try to do is use the example that Christ gives us in the Garden of Gethsemane. You pray for what you want, very, very clearly. God, give me the money to build this monastery. Go on. However, your will be done. And as long as you pour yourself entirely on both statements, you're safe. Because you're basically telling Christ, in my stupidity, this is what I believe to be true. This is what I understand as being your will and a way of me to fulfill your commandment. To pray for that person's health to pray for that person's safety, and so on. This is all I can understand. However, I do understand that things that I do not see, you see. And I do understand that from your perspective, you understand things much better than I do. You are like the eagle, I am like the ant. So it thou will be done. Do both. Ask like a child. I want that candy now. But then become a Christian and say that I will be done. At least I, that's the only way I found peace from all parts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For a minute again about the term spiritual father. Um, In what way? something that I, I've been questioning in my own mind over the last couple of years. I could listen to you all day. And I... Uh, how do you know if you need a spiritual father? Where do you find one? And, and will it conflict with my, my priest role as my father confessor? I, I just don't understand. The most important part of your question really is how do you know if you need one? Because that is the, the, the reality. Not all of us need one. And there's no, that doesn't imply, uh, as we, we, most people think, oh, monks and nuns, those who are closer to holiness, will need a spiritual father, whereas us poor folks here don't really need one. One of the greatest saints that we were given in the last century was Saint Siwon from the Holy Mountain, surrounded by some of the greatest spiritual fathers, he didn't have one. And we know that from his life, it's very clearly stated by his disciple, Father Sophroni, and everyone who knew him, Saint Siloan did not have a spiritual father. When he made his confession and when he sought advice, he would go into the church of the great monastery of Saint Pantelion, of the Russian church on Athos, and make his confession to whoever was the priest on duty that day. That's what he's done his entire life. So there's just, it's, it's not, not all of us need one, 
and uh, having one or not having one does not necessarily mean that you are on a low or higher kind of degree of holiness. I also feel awkward and I've never advised people how to get one because I can't just say uh, go to, I don't know, against Sainsbury's and buy one. <laughs> it's not done that way. If it were like that, it would be simple. In my case, the very first priest I made my confession at 18 years old is my spiritual father. So for me, it was a case of entering a church. That's how I, I found my spiritual father. So how can I then, I can again stress the importance of you turning your parish priest into your spiritual father. My, my suspicion is that if there is an answer, 90% of the spiritual fathers that people do have, those who do need one, are the spiritual fathers they themselves create, you yourself give birth to. Because that's, that's the natural way of things happening. If you need a spiritual father, and again, some people do, some people don't, but if you do need one, God will provide you with one. And the choices are that the one just in front of you will be the one. Because your need will transform that poor priest into your spiritual father. There's, there's nothing... But then again, don't try to mimic monastic life in your married life. This is something, it's maybe unconnected with your question, but it's something that's a great temptation in America. I get so many questions on this topic. It must be, I think it's the most frequent question I get. How can we live more of a monastic life? Asks the father of 13 kids. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> by this point, I actually suspect that that's a veiled way of really asking me how am I getting out of here? <laughs> Easy to make them, but to live with them when they are more than 18 and out of your house must be a nightmare for them. So it, it's just unhealthy. It's unhealthy. It's as unhealthy for a married person, male or female, to try to live like a monastic, as it would be for a monastic, male or female, to aim to live like a married person. It's just as unhealthy. Mm -hmm. But I'm not equating get it, having a spiritual father. No, that's why I said it, it's <laughs> unrelated. But Sorry. your question got me there. Uh, no, I don't. Father, the same thing. Please you keep me in your prayers. And come with that cross that you wear, come to Iona. Always have company. Thank you. Thank you. We are coming. Yeah, we are. We'll, 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 we'll Thank you. I'm ready. Thank you. I'm willing to see you there. Thank you, Father. Not everyone needs one. And if you do need one, God will know that before you do. So He will bring one before you. Most probably, your Father confessor. That's the answer to your question. Thank you. Yes. Last question. We um we were in our adult discussion. We were um, we focused on prayer um, this this quarter, and we focused on Anthony Bloom and his writings. And one of the things that we talked about last week was that he said um, when we take the prayer of somebody else, we could lie to God. And I think that you hinted about the authenticity of the person. And could you just elaborate uh, how one um, becomes authentic within their prayer, even the prayers that are given to us yes. by the church? Yes. Uh, I have a very silly way of explaining that which is that when I was probably about six years old, I fell in love. And there was this little girl, I still have lots of photographs of her. And you know how parents are, they like to play house with 
their children. So I loved her so at six. My way to express my love at six was to beat the life out of that baby. <laughs> I just saw her in like a group of little girls and I just had to kid her. <laughs> I don't know why. I have no idea because it's not in my nature. But that was the only way I have. Probably I felt the tension and I needed to get it out. So I just hit her. Of course, she didn't lead me anywhere. I mean, you know, that's not how what girls like. I discovered later on. <laughs> then, again, when I was about 13, 14, I fell in love again. Now by now, I was old enough to know that if I hit this one, I'm going to be in trouble. And I, I noticed other boys who were popular with the girls were not really beating the life out of them. So I went and I approached one of them. Like, how do you do it? I mean, how do you approach these girls? And he said, girls like poems. I thought, brilliant, I have to write poems. Huh? How do you write poems? I have no idea. And he said, what I do is I copy poems love poems, look for the cheesiest ones, and just give them the piece of paper. And they seem to like that. And it worked. Much better than the kitty. Later on, when I was about 17, I fell in love again. And by this time, after having copied all those poems, I kind of knew how to say what I was feeling and how to say I love you. And it kind of came out of me. And I think learning to pray is pretty much the same. Initially, we just hit God with the craziest things in the craziest ways. And it's a testimony to his patience that he doesn't just back up and go. <laughs> then we grow and older people around us, people who have fallen in love with God before and have some experience, teach us that actually there are books called books of prayers and if you just address God by using one of these you may have better results <laughs> that's what we then do for many years or even decades we just read these prayers that were given to us by people who were really in love with God and their hearts were on fire for Christ and also for us, because that's why they put those feelings down. There's nothing more intimate than to share with someone the depth of your prayer. There's nothing more intimate. And what happens is that slowly, slowly, as we copy these love letters, we call morning prayers, evening prayers, communion prayers, apathies, and so on, written by these wonderful saints, slowly our own prayer begins to take shape. And this is one of the benefits of having some sort of a guide in your spiritual life. Call that person whatever you want, spiritual father, father confessor, best friend, whatever, somebody who knows what they're doing because they have traveled this path before you, <coughs> because they will tell you. They will be able to discern when it's time to, if you pray for half an hour, as an example, maybe for a decade, you will just read given prayers for that half an hour. But there comes a point, and it's usually the other one who notices it, when maybe it's now more useful for you to read for 25 minutes and allow five minutes for your own prayer. Or maybe it's useful for you to read through the whole half an hour, but instead of reading uh, three apathists, only read one, so that it's more spaced out, so that you, your words fall heavier when you say them, and they make a noise when they, they fall. And then in time, you know, the ratio, or however you pronounce that, changes according to, to your own uh, spiritual evolution. So it's a process, it's not something that you decide, I either read or I say my own prayers, or it's a process, and this process is entirely personal, entirely. It, it, it is so different from person to person. 
I know, I know people who have learned to pray and have moved directly from red prayer to a prayer that has absolutely no words. No words. They just make prostrations. Or they just, they find a way to be, to generate the tension of prayer in their bodies, but their minds are entirely open and white canvas to God. And then there are everything, everything in between. If I were to, to give an advice if I were to give an advice in my absolute stupidity and lack of experience to anyone, it would be do not fear to try everything in your spiritual life. Try everything. There's nothing to be lost in this world, but there's everything to be lost in the other world. In other words, Try to fast any way you read in the lives of the saints, at least for one Lent, or for one week, or for one year. Make that experiment on your own life. Try to pray like any of the saints you've fallen in love with. If they only read prayers, do that for half a year and see how, how you feel about it. If they never read anything, do that for a while and see how you feel about that. If they prayed better doing prostration as they prayed, do that for a while. If they prayed better walking in the forest, do that for a while. If they fasted starting, I don't know, 2 p.m., and then they started their prayer at midnight, do that for a while. Do everything that you read and everything that Christ puts in your heart. Once you've checked it with your spiritual father or your father confessor, so you don't go nuts and you, you let the, the demons kind of inform you. Once you've made sure of that, try everything. And then you will be able to look back and discern which type of prayer has given you the most grace. And that's the path you should be taking. And then once you're on that path, there will be all sorts of other details for you to discern. Again, St. Seraphim. He always referred back to the example of his parents who, were, who had a shop. They were selling uh, hardware stuff for, for peasants. And he said that at the beginning of a year, of, of a new season, his father would bring as many tools in his shop as possible. As many as possible. And then three months or four months later, he would see how much he sold of each. And then he would only keep those Sold, that sold most and exclude the others and then continue to only sell those and then the next question in three months or four months was okay I do sell a hundred of these and I make a dollar in profit but I send I, I sell two copies of these and I make two hundred dollars a profit of these so if there's a matter of space in my shop which of the two do I prioritize he simply took the manner of thinking of a salesperson driven by the need to have a profit and apply it spiritually. He said, do the same. Try everything and be very careful to discern which of these things, what kind of prayer, what kind of fasting, what kind of vigil brings the most profit in your spiritual life. And that's your way. There's nothing, nothing to fear. And, you know, we do end up thinking of our spiritual lives as this boring, almost kind of draining, never-ending uh, things, when in fact they can be the adventure of one's life, because you learn so much about yourself. Good things, you learn how how many wonderful things God has planted within you, and bad things. You learn how impatient you are. You learn how much you would like to just get that prayer book and smash it to pieces. And you force yourself not to do it because you have decided that for half a year, I am going to read this prayer if it kills me. But as you go through the experience, you gain things. 
and you are changed by those experiences. <coughs> One last question. Uh, why is there a big Sarawaski and all the Sikhs Russia? I'm sorry? Why is Sretin Sarawaski your favorite book? It's not, I mean, he is my favorite, but it's not like I, I it's not like candy. You know, you <laughs> taste them all and then you decide, oh, I like that particular no. one. With things, things happen pretty much the other way around. Like the example I've given you, the same thing. <coughs> They pick us up. We don't pick them. We think we do because we like to think that. I mean, we are strong, proud people. We pick everything up. But the reality is that we don't. Like when I went to Iona, out of all those saints, it was this saint I'd never heard of, had no knowledge of his life, and he's the one who picked me up. And to this day, I pray to him like, like I would be talking to you. And the same thing happened to Saint Seraphim. And then I had my little kind of experiences with him later on uh, in, in my monastery. Um, you're not usually allowed to have any sort of input concerning the, light, the, the name you are given. Um, and I had been given the name Seraphim because I asked for the name when I became a Ryasophor. This is kind of an intermediary stage between being a novice and becoming a monk. And usually when you are made a monk, they change your name almost all cases, but I had no intention to lose Saint Seraphim. So I, I took a special canon to Saint Seraphim, I made some promises to him, and um, I nagged my abbot for months. Um, because the way they give our names in Moldavia is they, the abbot during the service, in his hat, will put some names, a few names. Uh, maybe seven, maybe three, just a few names. And then they say a prayer, and they just pick one up, and that's your monastic name. It's a way in which, again, there's this cooperation between us and God. These, these, these are our suggestions. You pick whatever you want. And all I could do is make sure that within those seven names in the hat, one was Seraphim. And I told Saint Seraphim, I've done my part of the deal, <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember looking up at my abbot, who did not want my name to be Seraphim. <laughs> looking up at him, though I'm looking at you, and he took the name, and I knew just looking on his face. <laughs> it's not a very good introduction into monastic life, but that was my introduction to monastic life. First of all, I mean, there are several things, but I'll probably just say two. First of all, what I've learned as a priest who has traveled for, I don't know how many years now, through all these parishes in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe and in America as well, every time I come celebrate, as I shall come celebrate tomorrow with Father, uh, each jurisdiction has its own peculiarities. And then each priest has his own peculiarities. I've learned to not be afraid of them and to just rejoice in them and accept them. If they are good enough for God, they should be good enough for Seraphim. So I never kind of interfere with what happens locally. 
The same applies for confession and, and uh, receiving communion, because if you go to Greece, for instance, they confess, if they confess, once a year, and then they receive communion every time they are in church. If you go to Russia, as you will go, you will see that they actually have a queue for communion during the, uh, for confession during the Divine Liturgy. So there's a queue over there where a priest has confessions, and then you immediately run to the second queue that takes you to communion. Romania is in between those two traditions. We had various kind of uh, mixtures. Uh, the most famous solution probably is the one that Father Cleopa gave us, which is you uh, make a confession and you receive communion every 40 days. But even that, on the one hand, is, is informed by the fact that we are between these two great Orthodox traditions that differ so much from each other, the Russian and the Greeks, but also by the fact that that happened during communism. So present in church was much more difficult than it would be today. A, a, a spiritual father, a confessor, an elder like Father Cleopa would um, give the advice that is useful to the people, again, the real people in front of him in that time during communism. The reality of things, again, for me, is very see If you think about things naturally, you realize that most things are very uh, obvious. What is confession? Confession is a cry of your heart. You have sinned, your heart tells you that you've done something horrible, and you need to make peace with God. That's when you make a confession. Not on the Sunday, not, you don't have it, you don't, you don't wait for 40 days, you don't have it like, every 40 days you put it heartbreak, and then four days heartbreak. <laughs> every time it happens, that's when there's a real need for you to make your confession. If that doesn't happen, then you're not really confessing anyway. If you go through confession just because you have to, and you kind of struggle to say something, or you say something, but you don't feel an, a real, you know, repentant feeling in your heart, then you're not doing it anyway. I don't, I, I don't know how, how else or how better to explain it. I do think that everything we, like prayer, yes, we read prayers for a while until that prayer becomes your own. Yes, there is a schedule of confession and receiving communion, and you stick to that as a rule, but the aim of that would be that you find your own rhythm. And that rhythm is the rhythm of, of your repentance. When you feel it, you make your confession. When you don't, you wait. And you struggle and you wonder, why don't I? Because I know I've done something wrong. I know that was the wrong way to interact. Why don't I feel sorry? Why doesn't my heart hurt me? And, and that, that takes these laws and these rules and makes them your own. And that's how you end up with you know, saints who confess and receive communion every single day. And saints like Saint Seraphim of Sorrow, who would receive maybe every other month when he was a hermit uh, in the forest. Or Saint Mary of Egypt, who received what? Once in, twice in her entire life. Yeah. When she went into the Egypt and then into Egypt, into the desert, and then at the end of her life. They're, these are not exceptions. They are just themselves. That was the path, that was the need, that was the story of those saints. And when I encouraged you to just try everything, I'm basically encouraging you to find out your own story and to, to write your own story. Allow these rules to guide you, but you have to find who you are and what your life, your spiritual life, really is like before we kick the bucket, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much, Father. So as Father said, he will be here with us tomorrow, and he'll be found celebrating liturgy with me. Um, I'll be found celebrating with you, and um, he will be giving a presentation on the monastery during coffee hour, so 
Um, you have an opportunity to do that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to transition for those who um, wish to stay, uh, you all stay. Um, we're going to be celebrating Vespers now. Um, so we're just gonna keep the tables where they are because after Vespers we have plenty of food and I don't want to take any home or to carry it anywhere else. And I don't think our good monk has a room big enough that he could put all that in his room tonight and eat it for tomorrow morning. So, um, so and it gives you time also to fellowship and to, to share your thoughts about the day after Vespers um, and spend some time with Father. Um, again, and just, just have that nice social time, as he said, to become the we of the humanity that God calls us all to be. So thank you, and I'm going to get things ready. And, and we'll do that.